you ever thought about using life insurance and a single premium immediate annuity as part of your retirement and legacy plan? Well, here to talk with us about that very topic is Kent Schmigdahl from Buckingham Strategic Wealth. Kent, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here, Robert. So you recently wrote an article about this very topic for Retirement Daily. Uh, We're eager to have you walk us through that article. Sure. So the backdrop, uh, Robert, is I had a client in their mid-60s that visited their insurance agent to get some Medicare supplements and uh, had no intentions of exploring any legacy planning strategies. And they walked out with um, a planning idea that I think is... um, interesting and has merit in certain situations. However, in this particular case study, it was not appropriate at all. So I can walk you through the, uh, the general strategy and, um, you know, in this particular case, why it was not appropriate for them. And maybe there's a broader theme here of just things to, to watch out for, or to be aware of when being pitched with a particular product. So this couple was in their mid-60s. Uh, in the article, I refer to them as Homer and Marge. And uh, so Homer and Marge visited their insurance agent, and they had most of their net worth was in an IRA. And so the, the strategy that was pitched was, let's purchase with those qualified dollars a single premium immediate annuity, a SPIA, and and then we will use the income stream from that annuity to purchase a life insurance policy on Marge's life. And then the children, rather than inheriting an IRA that has a lot of embedded taxes, they get a, an income tax-free death benefit. So it sounds like a great strategy, and, and I think in, in certain situations, Robert, uh, it, it, it's a very viable strategy. However, in this particular case, it was not appropriate. And I'll kind of, kind of share uh, why, why that was the case. Um, so, well, you know, first of all, legacy planning uh, was not their primary concern. Not running out of money was their primary concern. So that was red flag number one, is it was not addressing their highest priorities. Mm. Now, if legacy planning or leaving an inheritance was the most important thing for them, then I think that strategy could have been more applicable. Again, this is not knocking the strategy itself. I I think a a competent advisor can recognize when certain products like SPIAs or life insurance can be helpful in a life or financial plan. In this case, not running out of money was their highest priority. Leaving a legacy, yeah, it was something that uh, would have been nice for them, but it wasn't um, something that was critical for them. It was, if there's something left over, great. Um, So that was one thing that was a red flag. Um, The other other thing was, had they done this, they would have jeopardized their ability to meet their uh, their spending goals, their spending needs. And um, it, if legacy planning was uh, something that they wanted to explore, there were some better options for that. And then there was a couple of other sort of ancillary things that were not necessarily specific to this, to this particular strategy, more just an overarching general thing for, for anyone to be aware of when being pitched any kind of insurance product or, or annuity product uh, as part of an overall strategy. In this case, why exactly the insurance policy would have been purchased on Marge's life, I never did quite understand that. Hmm. If it was for legacy planning, a more appropriate product would have been a, uh, a guaranteed or a, a guaranteed universal life policy that pays out at the second spouse's passing or some kind of whole life policy that passes out or that, that uh, distributes assets pays out at the second spouse's passing. So I, I think that was just a, a mistake that was made in my estimation, specific to Homer and Marge's situation. Um, the other thing I happen to notice, and I see this a fair amount, Robert, the death benefit period, I don't believe 
was long enough. It was, it was uh, projected to last until we'll say 110 or 120 based on the interest rates at that time or, or based on uh, projected interest rates, projected dividends and so forth. But the guaranteed death benefit actually only lasted to 98, hmm. which, I mean, that sounds like it would, and it would cover most situations. It's all fine and dandy, as I mentioned in the article, until Marge is 97.8, you know, and the kids are starting to look at her crossways as she approaches her 98th birthday. It, it's a, it was, again, just, I believe a mistake that was made in order to sell a product. Right. That, that's my opinion. Yeah. A, a good insurance agent would have avoided um, both of those errors, in mm -hmm. my opinion. So it, it, a couple of questions come to mind as you describe the case study and the article. Uh, one is, uh, it would be important to have a, a team of advisors, someone that could provide a second opinion when tactics uh, and strategies of this sort are being promoted so that one, either it can be confirmed as an appropriate uh, uh, tactic, strategy, tool, technique, uh, uh, because in the absence of having maybe a team of advisors, uh, you might be inclined to take the advice of this insurance agent and ultimately maybe not achieve the thing that it is that you were trying to achieve. Yes. Um, I think it's, in this case, the, the work that that I did with this client, and also incidentally, another client was pitched the exact same thing from the same person. Um, I think that underscores uh, the value that a competent, qualified, and trustworthy team of advisors can bring to the table, Robert. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to be very clear: I am not knocking the, you know, the insurance industry. They provide very, very necessary products. I own insurance products myself life insurance and so forth. And um, it's just something that the consumer needs to be aware of that the insurance agent uh, that is uh, compensated by commission, there are other conflicts of interest at play mm. and they just need to be aware of that. And to have another pair of eyes someone that's sitting on the same side of the table as them to determine if the strategy does fit within their overall financial and life plan is invaluable. Yeah. So the, the other question is uh, when folks are trying to make sure that they don't outlive their money, uh, single premium immediate annuities are among the tools in the toolbox to use. Um, the, the, from my perspective, the interesting thing about ASPIA is that it will provide you income for life. It may not be as much income as you need to support your desired standard of living. So perhaps you wouldn't put all your money in ASPIA, but certainly as a tool, it, it does guarantee, uh, manage the miss, uh, manage and mitigate the risk of longevity. Yes. And that further underscores uh, how an advisor a qualified, competent, trustworthy advisor can determine when is a SPIA appropriate, what, what impact would it have on the ability for you to meet your spending goals, what impact does it have on the success rate, um, the probability that you're going to or not going to run out of money. So that's where, you know, determining what tools are available and what tools are appropriate is uh, how, um, you know, a fiduciary wealth management advisor, wealth advisor can, can add value. Yeah. And, and it strikes me that, you know, the ability to have, to be able to use all the tools in the toolbox is something that is uh, almost required of the advisor, given that uh, you don't want to, um, if a hammer is needed, uh, you certainly want that in your toolbox and, and uh, to, to use a carpenter who doesn't have a hammer in their toolbox, it just wouldn't make sense. Yes, most definitely. And I, I think, um, you know, Robert, sometimes our industry, the, the RIA space, sometimes we can be a bit too reactionary as an industry to insurance products. I was in the insurance industry for five years and I learned a lot. And there, there's a lot of appropriate uses for cash value life insurance annuities, you know, particularly SPIAs, single premium immediate annuities, 
and uh, to ignore the the um, how those tools can be used within the context of an overall financial or life plan is very, very useful. Mm. You know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm fond of noting that as you strike that balance between managing longevity risk and managing, say, inflation risk, is the notion that um, risky assets don't necessarily provide you with mortality credits as do uh, a SPIA, uh, but they do manage the risk of inflation, whereas maybe a SPIA does manage the risk of longevity, uh, but it doesn't necessarily help you manage the risk of inflation. So there, there, you may need, as you said earlier, you know, access to all the tools to accomplish some of the goals that you're trying to um, to achieve. Yeah, I would agree with that, Robert. And that's why the, the planning tools that we use, the, the Monte Carlo engine that we use, you know, if, if we have somebody that's borderline in terms of the outcome of their plan shows maybe they've got a 75 to 80% probability of not running out of money. Whereas we, we feel more comfortable if it's 85% or higher, we can model, okay, what impact will a SPIA have on the plan? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, you know, if a SPIA can boost that probability of success by five or 10%, that's a great use of that tool. If somebody's already at 99% and it'd be very, very difficult for them to outlive their money, you know, maybe purchasing guaranteed income uh, doesn't make as much sense or maybe is not as attractive. Ultimately, it's all about, you know, engaging and, and understanding the client, engaging the client, working with them uh, to give them the, a plan that gives them the highest probability of success.